Thank you so much for joining our webinar today, How to Win Brandon Hall Gold, Best Compliance Training of 2017. Uh, my name is Matt Plass, I'm the CEO of Interactive Services, and I'm joined today by Gary Collins, who's the Managing Director of the Compliance Management Division of BNB Paribas. Um, before we get started, uh, first of all, thank you so much for putting the time aside. Everyone has a very busy schedule. It means a lot that you're prepared to spend 45 minutes with us. Um, due to the number of people on the session, uh, we had a fantastic response to this particular webinar. It will be a one-way broadcast. However, there is a chat facility in the webinar. If you'd like to put questions um, into the chat facility, then we will do our utmost to answer all of them by the end of the session. Um, so Interactive Services is a training design and development organization, and we've been lucky enough over the last three years to work with Gary and his team at BMP Paribas. Um, particularly around the compliance area. And last year we won, or this year in fact, we won the Brandon Hall Gold Award together for the best compliance training of 2017. And I think when Gary starts to talk about his vision for compliance in general, and particularly at BNP, you'll start to understand why the programs that he's involved with have such a, uh, resonate so well within the organization, but also resonate outside the organization. So we were delighted to win. I think BNP Paribas were delighted to win. And today is really about breaking down what, what were the steps we went through putting that program together and particularly how did Gary's vision move from the, the drawing board into something that was alive and receiving a great response within the, uh, within the organization. So I'm going to give you a quick introduction to Gary and, and, and then as we walk through, really I'm going to allow him to describe the program in his own words. So Gary, uh, uh, man, hello? I, I'm here. You're there. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. So let me let me just give a quick intro to you, Gary. So Gary has extensive experience as a core compliance leader and a chief compliance officer. Um, his, among other things, his world includes ownership of the compliance framework within BNP. He also chairs the IHC Financial Security Oversight Group. He's a Vanderbilt University law graduate. He's a GE leadership graduate, uh, and he is a recognised thought leader. Um, among other publications, he's the co-author of the ABA bestseller. Warning the Witness, a Guide to Internal Investigations and Attorney-Client Privilege. He's also a former adjunct professor of SEC and Corporate Regulatory and Internal uh, Investigations. So Gary, Gary Collins' LinkedIn page says that he thinks strategically and executes tactically and having worked with him for three years, I, I'd say I have to agree. Um, so Gary, the, the first thing I think um, we wanted to start with today, and uh, it's actually on the next slide, there's a quote that I've heard you use several times before, and it's it's... Um, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. And I've heard that attributed to Benjamin Franklin and Mark Twain and Winston Churchill and a number of others. But the message, the message lives regardless. Maybe we can start there. What is it about that quote that you think resonates in terms of the work you're trying to do in the compliance world? Yeah, well, well Matt, first, thank you uh, and the interactive team for having me. It's been a great collaboration these last many years. And which as you kind of note has culminated into our being recognized by external stakeholders as, um, as, um, as, as thought leaders um, in this space. You know, when we look at this quote, um, let me just take a step back and, and make a couple points. I had a really important experience in my professional career and that was serving as a federal prosecutor. And the reason why that experience was so important to what I now do around training is that I was often um, given the task of trying to explain very complicated things in a very short period of time to lay people. And while I was doing that, and I encourage all the participants in this webinar to do the same, I started reading a lot about how people learn and how they absorb information. And one of the key takeaways from reviewing um, lots and lots and lots of academic scholarship is that first, the, average, the attention span of the average person uh, is very short. There's some data that says it's a matter of minutes, other data that says it's a matter of seconds. Um, and in fact, if you don't capture the attention right away, um, it's gonna, it, will, it will certainly um, be even shorter than that. So the, the whole concept of kind of shorter, more effective messaging um, I always viewed as critical and one of the most important parts and a key pillar, if you will, of any training program and, and every approach um, to training. The one thing I will just note, and Matt, it's something we'll just kind of, we'll probably keep coming back to over the course of the webinar, that this, is, this isn't about 
taking, you know, just cutting content out. Because quite frankly, you, you can't do that. This is more about trying to figure out how do I tell a compelling story um, in a shorter period of time. And it actually probably takes longer to do that than it is to just, um, you know, put large pieces of a policy in a, in a slide and then hit next. This is actually harder. It takes more time to do. Um, but whenever we sit down to work on a module, we always have this kind of quote in mind about if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter because we, we try to take the time to write a shorter, more thoughtful, more effective, more engaging module. Yeah, thank you, Gary. And, and when we released our compliance product a couple of years ago and we went to the market with samples and we said, you know, to, to our clients, what is going to make this exciting? You know, is it video? Is it, is it audio? Is it the visuals that will really make it compelling? And it, pretty much everyone told us the same thing is make it concise and make it short and people will love you for it. So I, I think that really resonates with me. Um, and just moving on, so when we, when we talk about the program for 2017, um, which is the, the award-winning program, and we look at the program goals, and we've got them up here on the screen, and I won't read them out um, one after the other. People on the webinar can take a look for themselves, but I'd be interested to hear from you, Gary. You know, what's the before and after here? So what was the state of play before you began this initiative, and, and why were these goals so important to you personally and to BMP? Yeah, so, and thank you for that. One of, so just so to give everyone an orientation, that myself and a uh, key member of my team, Jeff Langa, um, we basically started with a white piece of paper that the, the, the firm um, that we're proud to work for um, was coming out of a consent decree uh, around sanctions violations um, that caused us to pay a $9 billion fine. So we were trying to transform and rebuild everything we did around compliance and training was the first thing. So we were really starting with a, with a blank piece of paper and I'll just make three points about this slide. First, and I'm kind of taking the, the first two bullets together, that we realized quite, quite quickly that um, it's got to be global and the whole thing's got to be coordinated across the enterprise. Otherwise, it was not going to work. Um, that all the, like, if, however you're organized, whether it's local, regional, national, global, that it all has to kind of, kind of fit together, if you will. Like, just touching really quickly on the fourth bullet, the other thing that we were committed to was just realizing that, you know, we're in the 21st century and the user is expecting an experience that's akin to, you know, the best video game that they would see or kind of going online and think about the best website that you know of. Like Amazon's great, right, because it's so intuitive. That's the user experience that um, – that really drives a lot, it, it sets the expectation for what the users uh, is expecting to do. And then finally, making sure that we were coordinated with all the subject matter experts, that they were at the table, but in a place where we could um, lead, give guidance, instruct, and quite frankly, have the final say about um, what materials were going to be in the training, because the hardest thing to do, and I'm certain that all the training professionals on the line right now know this, that, you know, sometimes you're working with another function or a subject matter expert, and um, they're telling you the module's got to be two hours long. And you're, there's a lot of back and forth about, okay, well, how do we get that to something that's more manageable, that will be ultimately be more effective? And those were really kind of, I think, the key components to the success that we had in 2017. Matt, are you still there? Hello? It sounds like we, we lost no, Matt, Gary. I'm, no, I'm here. Yeah. Sorry, my computer had a little brain freeze, um, but it's back again. Uh, okay, okay thank you. <laughs> we're good, we're good. So you just, you just mentioned, Gary, the course length. Um, 55 minutes down to 28 minutes was, was the average. That, that's significant. Um, having worked with compliance departments and training departments over a number of years, I know that course owners, the people who own the, you know, the various courses, that's not an easy sell necessarily to take it down that way. So tell me a little bit about that. So how, how did you gain the buy-in internally for that reduced amount of time? And did you have any concerns about what regulators might say or what the, uh, the rest of the business might say around that quite drastic reduction? Yeah. 
Yeah. So again, all good questions. And, and this is, this slide probably is a few words on this slide probably represent like the most important, the most difficult um, challenge that I think that we had last year. So I think a couple of things first um, that to, 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 again, remember reducing the time. It's not about cutting out content. It's about presenting the content and the, the whatever was in the 55 minutes, somehow gets mentioned or included in the 28 minutes in a more thoughtful fashion. Um, and once I was able to explain that to the subject matter experts and our kind of key stakeholders, I was able to uh, eventually kind of get the buy-in. Now, again, I, I just will, you know, it's actually easier to write a 55 minute module. It, it just is. Um, Cause you just put all, throw all the content in there and you just keep hitting that. So it took a lot more time to kind of get there, but to get things to what was an average of 28 minutes, um, I think was critical. The one thing you'd be surprised with regard to the reaction from the regulators is, um, quite frankly, they liked it. You know, I uh, work in one of the most heavily regulated industries in the world, um, finance and banking, and our regulators were actually, you know, you'd be surprised when you have conversations with them that, they were actually looking for more creative training. They they asked us if we were going to include uh, gamification and video and uh, other um, kind of more innovative learning techniques in our training program without us even initiating thing anything with them. So um, a hard sell, hard work. But I think the key point from this slide is that it's not about just cutting out half the content. It's about thinking. Uh, thinking, being thoughtful in, in, in terms of including all that content in um, a, a shorter package. Yeah, and, and actually that brings us, I think, onto the next idea, which is what does that look like? So um, on the screen now, we're showing what, what we call the sort of 60, 90, 30 principle, which is every 60 or so seconds. And actually, Gary, this goes back to what you were saying about people's short attention spans, which I think we all feel are getting shorter, not longer. Um, you need to get them to do something every 60 seconds, and that something has to be meaningful. I mean, don't ask me to click on a word to see some other words. You know, there has to be a sense that I'm actually engaging with the content. Um, exactly. and, and if we do that, and if you get multimedia rich, uh, make sure you're not asking too much of people's time. You know, so maybe maybe you could speak just a little bit to this piece. What? Um, how did this guide the design, as far as you're concerned, and uh, what impact do you think it's had on the learners? Okay, so first on the 60, you know, meaningful interaction every 60 seconds, it keeps them engaged. But you're actually, you're, 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 you're accomplishing two things. Number one, you're keeping the user engaged. Number two, I think as training professionals, we all worry about the staff member who's just hitting the next button and not really even watching what's going on. And so by doing that, you're making sure that, like, you've got to be engaged while you're watching this module. The videos and scenarios, um, you know, again, short, like these, you, we are producing, interposing in the training module, like these short vignettes and films and movies that are 90 seconds. Um, but the key thing um, is that we like them as often as possible to be scenarios. If you remember at the top of the talk when I was talking about how people learn, the other kind of key takeaway that I think you'll, you can find from the academic scholarship in this space is that people, you're, the way the human brain is, is wired, that it, it remembers stories. It does not remember like a, a long list of rules. And this has been proven over and over and over again. It's why you can remember a song that you learned as a child, even uh, as an adult, because a, a, a song is a story. So whenever we can with these videos or anything else we're doing in the module, we're trying to tell a story because we know that it's much more likely for that to be re uh, retained. And then kind of back to the final point, we're trying to keep them short. I just have a personal belief. I worked for a, a gentleman, uh, Eric Holder, in my former life who used to say uh, when we're talking about making cases to a jury and opening statements and these super complicated cases, Anything can be explained. Anything can be explained uh, in a matter of minutes. Now, it's, it's harder to kind of figure out how to do it, um, but in terms of how it translates into the training program, we try really hard. It doesn't matter what it is to see if we can keep it under 30 minutes. Yeah. 
which, which I think is, is very important. I mean, I, th if, I think if you give somebody a 60 minute course, they'll end up clicking through the slides trying to get to the end, not because the content is bad necessarily, but just because 60 minutes is too long for a single sitting. Yeah, so, and it, uh, you know, again, you asked a really good question about regulators. If you engage your regulators on these topics, I think you'll find that they'll agree with what you just said. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we're always, and, and I suffer from this also, I, 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 I am very concerned and very focused on what their reaction is going to be, but I've just found when I've engaged on the topics that they agree, um, and, um, you know, we did a, a whistleblower module that was four minutes long, and they saw it, and they thought it was like the greatest thing they've ever seen, um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it can be done. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk a little bit about the visual design. Um, so the art direction that was used in the modules uh, was very deliberately chosen to match the kind of quality of the advertisements that go out from BMP um, and, and also deliberately featured real people. And, and just for anyone who's not sure what we mean by real people, that doesn't necessarily mean people who work for BMP, but it, it means the kind of people you might actually see in the office, in the cube next to you or across the hall. Um, rather than the sort of models or stock phot photography people that we're used to seeing in e-learning. And I think from our point of view as a training design company, we always recommend using very realistic looking people because it's, it's all about people. All training is about people. Um, and the more personal you can make it, the more likely it is to stick. But I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on, on the approach you took with the visual design. Did you learn anything from it? I mean, were there any, uh, is there anything that coming into 2018 you might do slightly differently from a visual point of view? Yeah, so I would say two things. First, um, it must be visually spectacular because, um, you know, again, you, you've got to understand, think about, appreciate, like what the user sees in the 21st century, whether it's a film or a movie or an app, it's got to be visually spectacular. And then the second thing was, you know, and it, it, uh, while it's got to match the branding of the firm, the other thing that I realized was that this is not something we were going to be able to do by ourselves. It just, there was no way to get to where we wanted to get to without bringing in some help. So in my case, it was you all in interactive that, you know, I think you guys understood that one of my first directives was it's got to be visually spectacular. Um, and um, I, uh, I think I, you know, I, uh, you know, myself and Jeff and our team, we think we're creative, but I, the, the thing that was great about the collaboration was, you know, we had a thought in our head and like you could show us options of things that would fit our brand and that would fit in the BNP Paribas mold. So visually spectacular, but kind of sensitive to the culture of the firm. Yeah, and that's a fine line, isn't it? You, you want to push it just to the edge so that people are seeing something they haven't seen some before and they get excited, but not so far that they feel as if you've lifted something from another organization or from another culture. So I think that's... Yeah, uh, I think... I also, listen, I, we work in banking, right? So it's not that we're, we're not going to... It's not going to look and feel visually the same it would if you worked in... Um, I don't know, uh, you know, a, a video, a video game company, like whatever. We're, we're there's a particular culture within our firm, and it's like, uh, or within our industry, that was important to capture. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, it brings us on to the next slide, which is about using the adaptive HTML5, um, so that we can make one version of the training available on any device. Now. That's ubiquitous now. Um, almost all organizations want their content to be mobile ready. I, I'd be really interested to, to hear, first of all, Gary, what extent do people actually take the training on something other than their desktop PC? It, it, it's very high. You know, um, Jeff Langer, who's on the line with me right now, um, you know, we, the number one point of feedback we received in 2017 was, I need to be able to take this thing on my iPad or my phone, particularly with our senior leaders who are traveling frequently. Um, if you're dealing, particularly if you're dealing with a learner who, um, you know, in our firm, we give 60 days to complete any training or training module. And for the folks who are on day 58 or 59, and they, they're on a trip, they've got to be able to take it on any device. Now, from a design perspective, um, and I think, Matt, you gave us this advice, too, that um, from a design perspective, if you know that going in, um, you may put fewer bells and whistles in the module to make sure that it works or it, it can be visible on a phone. But 
and today, and, and you know, kind of goes back to the point that I was making earlier about it's the 21st century. If they can't do it on uh, any device, uh, it, you're, we're just you're really doing a disservice to the population with inside your firm. Yes, absolutely, and I think going into next year, and as we start to talk about a plan for 2018, you know, it's worth thinking about. What, what do people really use their phones for and what does an optimal phone or iPad experience look like versus a laptop or a desktop experience. But um, certainly there's a, a comfort in knowing that everything we've designed will be available to people wherever they are and at any time. Um, sure. And then let, let's talk about the gamification element a little bit because applying certain elements of gamification um, to keep the learners engaged, we, we all know how effective that is. Obviously. Gamification, um, well, it's a huge world that you're entering into. When you move into gamification, it could be a little or it could be a lot. I'd be interested to know, what, what did you hope to achieve through gamification? What was it that you thought would add to the courses? I mean, I wanted this to become a thing where they're looking forward to doing this. Now, um, now, listen, the, the vast majority of your population is, you know, they're not going to kind of wake up in the morning and kind of jump out of bed and say, I can't wait to do my anti-competition training. But I do want to, I did want us to get it to a place where um, there was a fun element to it uh, that, so while they're having some fun, they're learning, the key balance that you're always trying to strike is um, some topics are just sober and they're not funny at all, um, anti bribery and corruption. So you don't want to get too cute to where, um, you know, again, I go back to my regulators, where they would look at it and go, you made too light of a very serious kind of topic. But at the same time, you know, really, I want to get, all, the goal has and continues to be to get all these things in a place where there is a fun element to it, where, you know, they're, they're doing it, they're kind of looking forward to it, they're wondering what else we're going to come up with to try and um, uh, surprise them, if you will. Uh, so it's really more about, like, again, engaging and then keeping them engaged. So back to some of the points, again, that we made at the top yeah. of the webinar. Where, you know, short attention spans, like, how do you keep people um, locked in? Yeah, so to, just two quick follow-on uh, questions, Gary. So first of all, what kind of feedback have you had from the organization? Has it been universally well-received? Do some people feel that it's a little inappropriate? And the second question on the back of that is, um, how, how do you apply gamification without making the modules longer? Yeah, so all good questions. Um, so first, the response has been overwhelmingly positive, um, and including, um, but not limited to, our senior leadership team on the business side and our CEO. The one thing I would just, on your last question, I would just advise, the entire module just can't be a bunch of games. It, it, it just can't, because the, you're not you're not going to achieve your learning objectives. So, like I sometimes um, call these bells and whistles, or I think of a kind of um, we're in the holiday season right now, right? And um, you don't want it to be you want it to be an elegant, tasteful, beautiful Christmas tree decorations. And everyone's seen the Christmas tree that's got ten thousand ornaments on it, and it's just become this gaudy mm. thing that really it kind of loses its meaning and its appeal. So I think the one thing, you, I think you have to have these in the module, but I would not overdo them. Uh, I would say, you know, one or two, at most three, but it, the, the entire module, I, I don't think it can be one constant series of kind of tricks, if you will. Um, I think that they have to be interspersed within the module. Yeah, I agree completely. I think we always say that it's, it, it needs to be a learning module that feels a bit like a game, not a game that has some learning in it. Um, you need to be yeah. able to control. Yeah. You need to be able to control the journey. You need to be able to control the time someone's going to be in it, um, and it's really just about kind of giving giving it that extra lift. Yeah, and as training professionals, you're always thinking about when you sit down to write the module. Well, what are the learning goals? And then what Jeff and I actually do is we sit down and we say, what are the two or three things the person must remember after they're done with this? And sometimes one of those three things will be driven home by, um, you know, one of these games, if you will, but not all three, um, you know, because um, it, it, it can be overdone. Yes, absolutely. So I, in the interest of time, I think we're going to 
go in have a look at some of the courseware now. So we were and maybe Great. we'll come on to talking about the the twelve months afterwards. But Neil, a colleague of mine, I think is just going to run us through um, an example that will illustrate some of the instructional principles that we can see um, on the slide at the moment. So we're talking about learner engagement, we're talking about real life scenarios, we're talking about gamification, and we're talking about intuitive design. So Neil, I'll hand over to you to just walk us through uh, an example here. Sure, yeah, so what, what you're seeing here on screen is the introductory menu. So uh, Gary spoke about keeping the topics short and engaging. So you'll see there as soon as somebody goes into the menu of topics, they see exactly how long each piece of the training is going to take them. Uh, they can go in and take in each individual component uh, at different stages if, if they want as well. So when we launch the first topic, I'm just going to open up the new tab here, we see an introductory video uh, where we're presenting the fundamentals and the principles of the topic. So uh, I'm just going to turn my audio on here and let that play for maybe 15 or 20 seconds uh, and then we can pick it up again afterwards. Organizing, we manage compliance risk at BNP Paribas through an independent control framework. Organized according to the three lines of defense model. Business units are the risk owners and serve as the first line of defense. Permanent control, personnel, groups, or functions make up our second line of defense. Periodic control, our audit function, acts as our third line defenders. Regardless of whether you are a first, second, or third line defender, you are a key component to our shared goals of ensuring BNPP's compliance with internal and external rules and regulations. Okay, so I'll just pause it there. So what we're really doing here is presenting the fundamentals and the principles of the topic. The videos are deliberately short, maybe 60 to 90 seconds in length. And once we've been through that introductory piece, we then move on to a scenario where we need a character and we have to apply some of that learning. So it's giving us an opportunity to explore some of the gray areas. We meet a colleague and by giving the colleague some advice, we're, we're putting some of that learning into practice. So we choose the appropriate piece of advice for Emily here. I'll hit submit. So I haven't chosen the correct answer first time. I'll have another go. So second time round, I've got it right. And on the next screen, I'm going to get my feedback as to why that answer was either correct or incorrect. So if I make a mistake, that's okay because I can learn from that mistake before I then get into the assessment or the quiz, which is the piece that we would score and track. So if I move on to an example of that, so you'll see we test for understanding through binary questions. So yes or no, true or false, correct or incorrect style of question. And as I answer questions correctly here, I'm building up my energy bar there at the top of the screen. So uh, we touched on elements of gamification there. That would be one thing, uh, a progress tracker or an energy bar, something very simple like that to, to give it more of a gamified feel and then having quick fire questions that, that people can easily take on a cell phone um, is, is very useful as well. So the default pass mark there is is 80%. So I've passed in this instance um, and, and then that, that can obviously be set up and customized specifically for, for each course and each requirement. And that's the piece again that we would score and track on the LMS as well. Yeah, and I, so I would just add like in that whatever that's probably like two minutes of this module I, I'm always thinking in terms of 30,000 feet, 20,000 feet, and then take them down to the ground. So even in that short thing, I saw that we started them out at 30,000 feet. Like, okay, what is this? What is the framework? Like, what is like what are the key principles? Like, how does this work? And we took them to 20,000 feet, where you know we're introducing them to a character. It's within a scenario because we're kind of go back to the scenario point again. And then finally, to get them down to the ground. Um, and into the weeds or into the dirt, like they're taking this assessment and quiz and you're actually asking them questions about what they thought, uh, you know, you're actually asking them questions to kind of test whether um, the things they learned at 30,000 feet and 20,000 feet really kind of sunk in. And that methodology, I think intuitively, I always have in my head. Um, and we've, um, and you know, this is an art, not a science, but I think um, uh, it's something that's, uh, it's an approach that has worked well for us. Yeah. 
Chris. Fantastic. Okay, thanks so much, Neil. So just as Neil's moving us back into the presentation, Gary, I think the, the, the other piece we should talk about is the completion piece, so how you drove completion, because I think one of the things that you were most proud of from this initiative was your completion improvement. Um, yeah. So back, yeah, perhaps you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, again, just to take a step back, you know, Jeff and I inherited a situation where um, the um, we didn't the organization did not have the discipline it it needed around driving completion, and um, the time periods to take training were very long. They were like uh, people were given either twelve six months or twelve months to complete a training. So training would be assigned in January and it wouldn't be due till. December 31st. Um, one of the things that we did is we ran a bunch of analytics about like how people complete the training and we found out that no matter what you do, no matter how much time you give the staff member, there are I think 54% or 46% on some trainings, 54% of the people are going to take the training in the last 72 hours. It just is. It's, it's human nature. It's the term um, paper kind of uh, phenomenon. So um, we incrementally um, built controls in to make sure that we're actually getting, we're, tr or we're trying to get to 100% um, by the time the training, uh, on the training two days. So we send reminders kind of periodically, but they're targeted. They're only going to the people who have not completed the training. And I think you can, I've seen people really hurt themselves in their program by just kind of, kind of blanketly setting out, sending out emails. Um, uh, and they're not to the right people. So, but the reminders start um, one week before the due date if they haven't completed it. They get another one on the due date. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that one week after the due date, hopefully this has not happened, um, a delinquency email is sent to the employee. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, two weeks after the due date, which kind of in our firm, that would be really bad news, um, the delinquency email is sent to the staff member and their manager. Uh, and then finally, if you go to the final slide, uh, after six days, the training is removed from your profile. Notification goes to HR. Um, we're actually making this control even tighter right now. And it's clear to every, every member within our organization that if you don't complete your mandatory compliance training, that it will affect your employee rating and your bonus. I will just note that, um, and this is a really, really important point, that before we could do any of these things, we first had to improve the, the product, right? Because if you're going to tell someone that their employee rating and their bonus is going to be docked because they didn't do their training, well, the training better be easily accessible, it better be compelling, and it better be worth everyone's time. So it's a two-way street. And the reason why we focused first most on rebuilding the program was because we realized that we had to do a better job as compliance professionals meeting our side of the bargain. Now that we have, we've gotten stricter and we're gonna get even more strict than kind of what you see here in terms of the staff members' obligation to complete it on time. Yeah, and did you uh, have feed, so obviously I know that your completion rates have gone up. Did you have feedback from the organization as to which component had the most impact in terms of putting those numbers up? So was it the email, the communication, or was it the quality of the training, or would you say it was a combination of all three? Which which single thing that you did had the biggest impact on the uh, the completion rates? Yeah, I think it's you know this. I mean, again, it's art, not science. But I think surprisingly, I think improving the quality of the training. Um, you know, two or three important points. First, the governance matters. So once we changed and said, okay, our our training is going to be issued on a quarterly basis and it will be due on the final end of uh, the final day of the quarter. And then we're going to keep Q4, th uh, uh, Q4 free. Um, we're going to get all the training done in the first three quarters. We're going to keep Q4 free. That actually had an effect. Just that had an effect on people. And then when they saw that the modules were better um, and kind of more thoughtful, uh, that helped drive, you know, kind of like word of mouth, right? It starts spreading folks are like, well, yeah, go ahead and take it. It's going to take you 12 minutes or, you know, 22 minutes or whatever it is. Yep. And um, it's actually quite good. So I actually, it's probably a combination of those, uh, of those two things, but that's really just having a big hammer over somebody's head is not what I think got it turned around. What got it turned around was 
more discipline around the governance and a much better product for the the for the for the staff member yeah that makes that makes it perfect sense and so if we could move on Neil I did there's a couple of things I wanted to pick out um, just before we close out in terms of why I think this initiative was an award-winning initiative. So I think the training was very high quality. I think what Gary and Jeff and his team put together was sensational in terms of showing people at BNP something they've never seen before. Um, I think aligning that to the communications that went out to the business so the whole organization was clear on what, what are we doing and why are we doing it and why is this good for everybody. And then those tweaks to how they drive completion uh, and I think what Gary said is absolutely right. You you get you, your house in order first. So to, to be able to say, we've given you really streamlined, really great training. Now it really is up to you. There should be no excuses for not doing that. I think all of that pulled together makes for an award-winning program. But I think there's something else as well. And you mentioned it right at the top, which is the piece about change management. So the fact that you recognize that this is new for the firm and that you took steps to make sure that it was implemented in a way that the firm could accommodate um, rather than just dumped on them from a great height. I think that component also goes a long way towards making it an award-winning initiative. So, you know, in, in our submission, we tracked against the benchmarks for managing change. You know, are you raising awareness? Are you creating desire? Are you increasing knowledge? And, you know, this slide and the next slide, just a, a couple of points on those. But I think the fact that you were aware of what, what is the impact of BMP going to be and how do we manage that, mitigate it, create excitement about it, et cetera, um, was a key component. So I, I don't know if you have any final thoughts just around the change piece, what you did, and, and maybe even what you might do differently next time. Yeah, I think, um, so I'd say a couple of things that, and, uh, you know, I think we all, as compliance professionals, we all know this, um, that, um, Changes, change management is just hard. It's the hardest thing any organization can do, any function, any function within inside of a function. Um, it's very, very, very difficult thing to do. Um, I think the things, the, like the closing thought that I will leave is that um, while it, you know, while it was obviously a hard thing to do, I mean, ultimately with inside of our firm and really the, the truth is in, um, and some of the feedback we got from our regulators that it's ultimately made us as an organization more safe and secure, and which is the total overall overarching goal. Like, is this thing, this training program gonna have an impact that's gonna make the organization better off? So um, it, it's a long road. Um, I actually also think you, can't, you can never be sitting on your laurels. So while we, had, we created this great content for the, for the staff, you can't show that to them year after year after year. I mean, the reason why, um, you know, resources become critical here is because you have to, you know, you have to be able to change every 12 or 24 months because um, you can't keep showing them the same content. Um, but, uh, you know, again, if the end goal is to make the company, to make the firm safe and secure, uh, I think, you know, all the things we're talking about right now and, and really just kind of underscores the importance of um, training professionals in any firm um, helps you achieve that objective. Yeah, absolutely. And if we, if we just round out by that sort of the achievement of that objective, so Neil, if you look at the by the numbers slide, so um, when we submitted the award submission, Gary, you know, we called these three elements out as being what we thought were the greatest achievements of your program. Um, would you still agree? Are these the three things that for you feel you're most proud of when you look back at that program? Yeah, I think um, there's no question about it. Although the one thing I would just say is um, in terms of our completion rates, we're not, we, we've now, we're not in a place now where we're not done until we're at a hundred percent. I think some of these uh, numbers represent numbers that, or well, what was the number at the due date, but we keep driving it. Um, uh, you want to be at a hundred percent no matter what. Uh, but mm. these are the key things. Um, things if you kind of look back and um, and and you know you're trying to get a sense of okay what did we get out of this uh, yeah there's no question that um, the, the proof is in you know facts are friendly and the facts are indicative that if you can apply uh, you know again I'm not um, uh, I'm not uh, the, the world's expert on anything but this work um, like these principles that we talked about over the course of this last 45 minutes worked and worked well for us as a firm.
Yeah, absolutely. So I'm aware of time. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, Neil, have we had any questions come in? Yeah, we've had a few. So um, two questions actually around the, the mobile compatibility and, and the mobile element of the training. So um, Gary, are people taking their training on company issued mobile devices or is it a bring your own device policy and people can take the training there? Yeah, so it's a great question. So we have a bring your own device policy with inside our firm. Um, and the goal right now is to make all the training um, available on all those platforms. Um, so, um, yeah, that's it. Okay. And then Matt, maybe a, a follow on for you on that one. So, um, does, or do changes to operating systems. So for example, when Apple update their iOS system, does that impact the course and do, how do we future proof the content? So it's a very good question and the answer to that is you never know what they're going to do next. And sometimes the changes they make do have impacts. Um, I mean, I think there's, you can look at it in two ways. So the, the HTML5 um, engines and frameworks that we use to build content, and I think it's the same across the industry, they are what you can call mobile ready. So the content that, that is created in theory will work on any device because it adapts to that device. Um, but if you're thinking of rolling this out, you should think about the specific devices because mobile ready doesn't necessarily mean it's been tested across every device. And that's why it's always worth looking at what are the three or four devices that we think are most common in an organization that we're going to test every single button, word, screen in our content against. Now, there are hundreds of devices out there. You can't test for everything, but the key, those key devices should receive robust te um, testing because there are new releases every year, new devices, new updates to, to, to the platforms, and we just don't know what's coming next. So it is, it is a, a bit of a minefield. Yeah, I would, just to underscore that, like, I would just say testing, 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 because, boy, it's just a disaster with inside the firm if, it does, if, if the module doesn't work. So you want to have gone through it. You test everything that humanly possible that it could be tested on to make sure it actually works, because if it doesn't, um, that technical glitch is going to take away from all this hard work and great creativity that you brought to the module. Yeah, I, I would add to that as well. One of the advantages of going browser based, which we have done in this instance over using an app is that, um, you know, apps regularly have to be updated. And if a new iOS does come on board, apps have to be updated on, on, on different devices. So it does avoid that by, by going with a browser based technology as well. Um, and then Matt, a, a question on the use of binary questions in the assessments. So we have a question from Adam, what the thinking was behind using binary style 50-50 chance type of questions when even if somebody doesn't know the answer, they actually do still have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. They do, and it's a good question. I mean, I think um, there are a couple of things come into play here. One is we're not trying to catch people out. Um, we want people to absorb the content. We want people to engage with the assessment, but we're not trying to make the questions difficult. If you've, if you've engaged with the content, you should be able to answer the questions fairly, fairly quickly. Um, what you'll notice at the end of our topics, and I'm, I'm not sure it came across in the demo, is every single learning point has a number of those multiple choice, um, oh, sorry, single, single choice uh, binary questions. So you're actually receiving quick fire questions one after the other to test your understanding. I mean, to Gary's point about reducing the courses from 58 minutes to 30, our, our goal is not to keep people locked in an assessment for 20 minutes um, until they get everything right. We want to make it as streamlined and smooth as possible. Uh, really, the, our job is to make sure the content is so engaging that they, they genuinely pay attention to it and the quiz and the assessment is written in such a way that they can get through it quickly but that it is, it is meaningful. It doesn't matter. I'm a, what, what I would say as an instructional designer and one who's worked as an instructional designer for many years, it doesn't matter how complex or, or uh, clever your assessments are. If people haven't paid attention to the course, they're just going to click an answer and hit submit. Um, the, really, the trick is in the content piece that comes before the assessment to make sure that you've engaged them fully. Yep. Or you can, get, and then you can also give them a blend of different kinds of assessments throughout the firm. I mean, you don't you don't have to always use the binary um, question and answer, but you, you, you know, um, um, but I, listen, I agree with what you said. Like the point isn't, um, you, you don't want to make the, the questions like so incredibly difficult that like only, um, 
you know, the uh, most practiced subject matter expert can answer them. Um, you're really just trying to gauge are the key learning points kind of sinking in and have they appreciated them. And, and of course, I mean, even with the binary questions, the options are randomized. So you, you will always need to read the question. You'll always read, need to read both of those options and make your choice. Um, for other, and interestingly, for other types of training in other contexts, we wouldn't necessarily use binary. But I, I do think it's appropriate here. I think it, it creates streamlined, fast, effective assessments that are tied to individual learning points and topics. Um, very conscious of time. Neil, maybe one more question for um, Gary? Yeah, yeah so we, we have had f quite a few questions come in, so if we don't get to all of them, uh, we will follow up with each person individually who has submitted a question and we'll do our best to respond to those directly with you. But Gary, final one for you is, um, has BNP Paribas applied this same level of customization to each one of your compliance training courses or did you pick one flagship course um, and do less customization on the other ones? Um, boy, is that a good question. Um, we did it to all the courses because we, um, and it was incredibly hard. Um, uh, if I had to do it over again, um, I may have thought about a different approach because it really just killed us that first year, but we were just committed to, because what we didn't want to do was put out one great thing, right? And everyone was like, wow, this is great. And then the rest of it, you know, clearly was falling beneath that standard. So we worked really, really hard over like a 12 to 18 month period where we did everything all at one time. And, it, and Jeff's on the line. It almost killed him. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, the other thing we were trying to do is accelerate the change in the program. Um, and we wanted to do it you know, within a one-year period of time, which was ambitious. But, Boy, it's a good question. I would not criticize someone for trying to take another approach um, and just trying to incrementally change, you know, one or two modules. But for us, we wanted to try to do the whole thing in, in, um, on all modules. Okay. Well, as Neil says, we will, uh, every single question that's been sent in, we will find an answer for it either from myself or from Gary, and we'll come back to everyone who's been on the session. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is uh, you are welcome to join us at the Irish Consulate next Thursday for our regular Compliance Learning Advisory Board. Um, we have 30 global heads of compliance in attendance. I think we have two or three, maybe four slots left. Um, so if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, it's in Midtown. It's uh, the Irish Consulate is 52nd and Park. Um, please get in touch and uh, we'll see if we can find a slot for you. They're very popular events. It's a wonderful networking opportunity for compliance professionals to meet. Um, within industry, but also cross industry. And, and the feedback we have is, is a, a great deal of value there. Um, so I'd like to close out by saying thank you so much to Gary and Jeff and his team for joining us today. I think it was really insightful um, and interesting investigation into, into the program itself, but also for me, what, what goes into making an award-winning program? I mean, that was the title of the webinar. And I, I think we've in, illustrated today why this program was worthy of winning an award. And it's, it's more than just good content and it's more than just um, reducing seed time and saving costs. The whole holistic package around changing how compliance is done at BNP and receiving not just a uh, warm welcome from the organization for the work you've done, but actually seeing those completion rates jump up through the quality of the training, through the mechanism of delivery and also through the follow-up around it. Um, Gary, any, any final comment from you before we close out? No, I would just say thank you for, for having me, and I would just tell all of the participants on the phone, I always love to see and understand what other people are doing, so send me a note on LinkedIn, and um, if you want to get together with myself and Jeff or at one of uh, Interactive's events, uh, we always kind of look forward to doing that because we're perpetual benchmarkers. So thank you again, Matt. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate it, and we'll be in touch with the questions and answers. Take care. Thanks, everyone.